In Key West during the war, after the election of Lincoln in uh, November, or in those days they didn't take office until March, uh, there was a period in there, there was great turmoil, and I think South Carolina was the first one to see from the Union and so forth. The uh, Army was here and uh, had, Fort Taylor was still under construction. It was still under the control of the Army engineers. The uh, Army barracks at Perry Court was where the fighting troops were, and the fort had not been turned over to them. So the Captain Brannan, who was in command of the Army troops here, had written his bosses and said, should I take over Fort Taylor? And because of the confusion in Washington and the change, of, nobody ever answered him. So on his own, on January 13, 1861, at night, he marched his troops over and manned Fort Taylor. He used a road that supposedly, another legend, that he had this road cut there. But come to find out, the road had been cut in 1855 because of a threat to war with Spain. So he, he had a road already. But he did take the fort, and basically, uh, they didn't know if there would be opposition or not. And, and there weren't, nobody really tried to stop him. And um, he took the fort, and some Navy ships came. Uh, nobody could uh, threaten Fort uh, Jefferson because the South never had a, a Navy. So those two forts and the city of Key West, of course, then remained in the Union throughout the Civil War. It was the only city in the South that remained in the Union. And part of it was that there was no great sympathy for the uh, southern cause here. Uh, most of the settlers, early settlers of Key West, uh, the first group had come from the north, the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, the other big group of settlers here were white Bahamians who came here, and slavery had already been outlawed in the Bahamas in the 1840s. So no great uh, support for the south here. The only people that were supporting it, they had been a few slaves here that were working in the, uh, probably the salt uh, works here. But the uh, wealthy people of Key West had bought slaves because when the federal government started uh, building Fort Taylor and Fort Jefferson, they were renting slaves to do the work. And so it turns out it was uh, a very good investment dollar-wise so a number of the wealthy people had, and, and we can see that in 1840, there was some 46 uh, slaves listed on the census in Key West. <clears throat> and of course, they started building Fort Taylor about 1845. So by 1850, there was 400 slaves in Key West, over 400 listed. So, so of course, they had an interest in uh, financial interest in preserving uh, slavery and the South. And uh, some of them uh, uh, were vocal and against it, and some of them left the uh, town and took their slaves with them. And Mr. Asa Tift, who was probably the largest slave owner, was one of them and took there. But uh, one thing about the uh, Civil War, uh, is it's well documented. Uh, newspapers still exist. Tons of letters, diaries, all sorts of unofficial documents are preserved. And so we have, luckily for us, a gentleman named Lewis Smith, who was from Pennsylvania. Uh, got interested in this project and he wrote a massive book of uh, about the Civil War. And it's a day-by-day -day account that he was able to put together of the events in Key West and uh, at the Tortugas at Fort Jefferson. So it makes uh, researching the uh, Civil War a much uh, easier task than it was before the Lord came along and did it. Uh, so it's, it's a beautiful book.
and uh, it's called Florida Keys and Fevers is the title of his book, Louis Schmidt. Uh, but anyway, so there was some, for whatever reason, uh, people who supported uh, the Confederacy. Uh, Fifteen men from Key West left and went to Tampa and joined the Confederacy in various ways. Some of them went to the Bahamas and then back to Tampa, but they left here and went. But over a hundred local people <coughs> joined a local militia that was formed to support the uh, U.S. Army that was here. So you can take the numbers from that. And when you read the diaries and the letters of the troops and stuff here, you, you don't see any great uh, uh, support like you do some other places for the, for the, uh, for the Confederacy and slavery. And uh, so it was probably pretty either neutral or pro-Union. And so it was an advantage to to the Union because being ideally located here, this made a perfect port for the blockading, East Gulf blockading squadron, because most of the uh, blockading that was, uh, blockade running that was uh, coming into this area came from Cuba and it was headed to the Gulf Coast. And, 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 uh, so they were ideally located and of course, we had people in Havana, you know, keeping track of things and the Navy here. So during the war, uh, over uh, 200 ships were caught running the blockade and brought here and adjudicated through the federal court. Uh, also operating out of here, the Army was raiding the uh, west coast of Florida. Florida had a uh, plenty of beef at the time, cattle, wild cattle all over the state that had been here since the Spanish days and had promulgated on their own. Uh, and of course the Southerners' uh, army needed food and, and everything, but food particularly, but of course there was no way to get the cattle, uh, live cattle to basically Virginia where the war was being fought or Tennessee. And so the only way was to, to salt the beef and, and, you know, preserve it and send it there. So the Southerners were doing salt works along the coast where they would take sea water and make, uh, you know, boilers and make uh, salt out of it. So one of the things the Army did here was go along the coast and raid the, and destroy any salt works they found. One of the events that, that happened during the war was that uh, somebody in Washington in the headquarters of the, you know, put out an edict that if anybody, if, where the Union troops were and if anybody had relatives behind the Confederate lines that could, they could spy and provide them information, they were to round up all these people and take them and put them behind uh, the federal lines, and there were certain criteria, you're married, and certain relationships, business, and so forth. So the local commander here started rounding up the people, he was the uh, commander of the New York Regiment. And there was about 300 names on the people that were going to be sent behind the Confederate lines. Well, it wouldn't like the rest of the place, there was no, of course, no Confederate lines here. The closest place they had Confederate lines they could do this was Charleston. So they were going to round these people up from Key West and put them behind the lines at Charleston. Of course, they didn't, people didn't know anything about it. Well, the previous commander here <clears throat> had been Colonel Good of the Pennsylvania Regiment, who was the regiment that was here uh, most of the time during the Civil War. So. New Yorkers were rounding up the people when Colonel Good was ordered back to Key West. He got back as this was transpiring and he stopped it. So the people then of Key West had a fundraiser and bought him a gold sword. And 
the gold sword still in a museum in Pennsylvania, beautiful gold sword. And how much it costs, I don't know, but I think, but I think it was probably, there's different numbers, but probably it close to several hundred dollars which maybe 700, uh, I don't, it, there's from 700 to 7,000, and whether cost we'll ever know, but it's a beautiful sword, still exists, and actually brought it back down here one year for the Civil War days. So, and Colonel Good was, you know, well liked it and so well by the people here and well respected. So that was one of the things that uh, happened here. Now, of course, uh, none of the uh, uh, troops here or Fort Jefferson were involved in any combat here. But a lot of people died from diseases, particularly yellow fever, two bad outbreaks of yellow fever. But yellow fever and all the other fevers and uh, dysentery and the stuff that happens in the military barracks. So lots of deaths and a lot of people, uh, which we're not sure of all of them, but we have quite a list and a lot of them are in the Lou Schmidt's book. The other uh, event <coughs> that happened uh, was the Army came here and uh, was recruiting African Americans to join uh, the Union Army. And so 126 men from Key West joined the Union Army and uh, went uh, to Charleston where they fought in Charleston and then later in North Florida. And uh, of course they had casualties too. Uh, six of the men were killed in action and 12 of them died of other causes during the war. Some of them came back after the war. Some of them, a lot of them seemed to have settled in Jacksonville after the war. So Key West uh, had prospered during the war. Uh, of course, the rest of the state was devastated. Jacksonville, where there was some fighting, practically disappeared as a city. So because of the, the war, Key West was prosperous. And at the end of the war, the Cuban migration started. So. Uh, by the latter part of the 1800s, uh, Key West was the largest city in the state of Florida.